Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. The Little War, the Battle for German East Africa and World War I At the end of the 19th century, European empires divided up their spheres of influence in Africa in what came to be known as the Berlin Conference of 1885. It was at this meeting that the German Empire was formally allotted three soon-to-be colonies on the African continent. These included German East Africa, which is today Tanzania, German Southwest Africa, which is today Namibia, and German West Africa, which is today Togo and Cameroon. These colonies represented the core of the German colonial empire that would later stretch all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Three decades later, after Germany claimed these colonies, during World War I, these colonies would find themselves precariously cut off from Germany and forced to operate independently to survive and secure German interests in Africa during World War I. World War I in German East Africa represented one of the largest military actions seen on the continent at that time. Today, however, the war in German East Africa tends to be overshadowed by the fighting of the Western Front. Just prior to the outbreak of World War I, German East Africa had seen the completion of an east-to-west railroad connecting the capital of Dar es Salaam to Kagoma in the country's interior. This accomplishment was to be celebrated with a large agricultural fair to be held on August 12, 1914, just eight days after the official declaration of war. However, the celebration never came to pass. The colony was also home to one of the most able civilian administrations in the German Empire, led by Governor Heinrich Schnee. He not only advanced the educational system to encompass over 8 million native Africans, but founded the Institute of Tropical Biology, which aided notably in the agricultural sector. Most importantly, the colony was recently assigned a new military commander in January of 1914, Colonel Paul Emil von Leto Vorbeck. Leto Vorbeck was well suited to command the small number of men allocated to German East Africa for the war which he anticipated to be coming soon. Vorbeck was a product of the Prussian military tradition. He had seen combat during the Boxer Rebellion as well as in other African colonial uprisings before being posted to German East Africa in early 1914. This prior experience away from Europe fighting unconventional wars made him a qualified candidate for the post he received. Upon arriving at Dar es Salaam in January of 1914, he set out to tour the entire country and his units in the field, so he could begin devising his defensive strategies for a war he believed was imminent. His force, referred to as the Schutztruppe, was at that time made up of 216 German officers and 2,540 black Askari. The Askari were a class of indigenous professional soldiers who had been employed by the Empire during the prior decades to aid in the defense of the colony from external and internal enemies. The Schutztruppe would grow in size during the conflict, but always maintain its 10 to 1 ratio of Askari to German officer. It was this force under the command of Leto Vorbeck that would lead the British Empire on one of their most frustrating campaigns of the war, a campaign which extended days after the official close of hostilities in Europe. When war was declared on July 28, 1914, Leto Vorbeck began to implement a strategy based on his knowledge of East Africa and geopolitics. His grand strategy was to bog the British down in Africa in order to draw Allied resources away from the Western Front. Leto Vorbeck knew the war would not be decided in East Africa, but he hoped to create the conditions for victory on the Western Front by requiring little support from Germany while inflicting even greater sacrifices of men and supplies from the Allies. His execution of this strategy was nothing short of extraordinary, and it was unlikely that even Leto Vorbeck could have fathomed the mayhem he would inflict upon the British in the years to come. The conflict in East Africa can be divided into two major phases. The first phase was a fighting defense of the colony, which intended to maintain territorial integrity. The second phase was what would amount to a fighting retreat. During the first phase, Leto Vorbeck scored some major victories, the most memorable of which was his defense of the port at Tanga, just north of Dar es Salaam in late 1914. Outnumbered more than eight to one, he repulsed the first major attempt the British made to take control of the German colony. During the battle, Leto Vorbeck utilized a number of modern tactics to facilitate his victory. 
he successfully deployed modern machine guns against the landing groups. British troops found themselves cut down by this modern weaponry on the beach just north of town. His troops set up lethal fields of fire during that battle and the many engagements to come. He also deployed the rail system to transport his troops quickly to the battlefront to engage the enemy. Leto Vorbeck's swift mobility was his signature tactic, and perhaps his greatest military advantage. This little war in Africa, as Leto Vorbeck referred to the engagement, might have been somewhat unconventional, but it had many of the trappings of modernized warfare that were found in the European theater. One particular problem for the British at Tanga and throughout the war was the highly motivated and loyal Askari fighters. The multiracial Schutz troop was dependent upon the ranks of Askari, who were highly trained and well compensated Wahihi and Angoni tribesmen. The British did not initially recognize the capability of the German forces. They believed the Askari would not stand a chance against English and Indian soldiers in battle. The British were almost sure the Askari would turn against their German officers when forced to fight. In reality, the exact opposite was true. Time and time again, the Askari and their German officers proved to be a lethal adversary to the British army. After defeat at Tanga, the British military retreated and attempted to contain the German colony while reassessing their capabilities and what would be needed to secure German East Africa. Victories throughout 1914 and 1915 bolstered morale for the Askari contingent already in service which created the proper conditions for successful recruitment to bolster the Schutz troops' ranks. Leto Vorbeck managed to recruit 12,000 Askari troops and an additional 2,000 irregular German fighters from the civilian German population during this time. Colonel Leto Vorbeck essentially sought to take the battle to the British directly during the first phase, thus creating the illusion of a larger force. When asked about this tactic, he stated, my view was that we would best protect our colony by threatening the enemy in his own territory. We could very effectively tackle him at a sensitive point. Leto Vorbeck also employed a menacing guerrilla campaign against the British Railway to the north in the early years of the conflict. These missions were often carried out by small units which would set ambushes on enemy camps or blow up railway cars and bridges then quickly disappear back into the wilderness. Tactics like these not only slowed the movement of men and material within the British African colonies, but it had the desired effect of tying up the British military defending supply lines in their own territory. Leto Vorbeck's army not only benefited from his tactical and logistical genius, but also from the benefits of being tied to a relatively self-sufficient colony. This was the handiwork of the colonial governor. After being completely cut off from Germany, with the exception of two blockade runners that were sunk upon arrival, German East Africa was on its own. The resourcefulness of this colony was an asset to Leto Vorbeck. They effectively fed themselves throughout four years under siege and managed to manufacture many essentials completely on their own. These included making gasoline from coconut palm, making their own shoes and clothes, vulcanizing their own rubber, and even distilling their own spirits. The military was equally resourceful in their ability to refit munitions, capture military supplies, and repurpose items such as naval guns for field artillery, and unused explosives into what was likely some of the first landmines to see action on the African continent. By 1916, Leto Vorbeck's tactics had proven successful. The British had dedicated over 40,000 soldiers and a contingent of biplanes to the endeavor of capturing German East Africa, along with Colonel Leto Vorbeck. While this was Leto Vorbeck's anticipated outcome, it also forced him to shift his tactics to forfeiting territory as he led the British army on a two-year chase in the African bush. Leto Vorbeck would move his forces into the forest away from any roads and rail systems, which the British would be able to take advantage of for resupply. These areas could not be reached by animal or machine and required human porters to resupply the British thus sucking up even more manpower and money. But in the wilderness, his seasoned troops could deploy another lethal weapon against the British, Africa itself. Leto Vorbeck used both African pestilence and weather to accumulate casualties upon his enemy. Between the mosquitoes causing malaria and the heat decimating unaccustomed whites, Indians, and Africans from different regions, Leto Vorbeck knew simply keeping the British deployed and in the field was a war of attrition he could prolong in great length. In the later years of World War I, Leto Vorbeck would eventually move through Mozambique, back into German East Africa, then into Rhodesia. 
a game of cat and mouse which he continued to master as the war drug on. He faced no less than five opposing commanders, the most unrelenting of which was a South African, General Christian Jan Smuts. Using a South African, which was at that time a possession of the British Empire, was not the preferred choice of the British High Command. However, logic eventually won out, and Smuts, who had considerable experience in the African bush, was chosen. Smuts succeeded in capturing territory at high cost, but he also continued to suffer from the same shortfalls as his predecessors. These included an inability to outmaneuver Leto Vorbeck and a blinding racism that continually led the British generals to underestimate the Askari of the Schutz troop and their own indigenous forces from Kenya. Leto Vorbeck's tactics cost the British dearly. A British soldier recounted the fate of his regiment, the 2nd Rhodesia Regiment, as being decimated not only by the Germans, but by the sickness and exhaustion. His regiment began the war at a strength of over 800 men, and would end 1916 with less than 50 men on the firing line only standing to fight when he absolutely must or when the odds were highly in his favor, Leto Vorbeck compelled his men forward on willpower and mystique. It was in 1917 when he would be promoted to Major General, of which he only gained knowledge of through a British messenger, further adding to his legend. During the last nine months of the war, while the Western Front was crumbling, the Schutz troop continued on, living completely off the land and resupplying themselves with captured material from Portuguese supply depots. General Leto Vorbeck continued to siphon off men and material needed by the Allies in Europe. As the war wound down, he even gained the grudging admiration of his adversaries as well. In the end, it was Germany which succumbed to defeat when they surrendered on November 11, 1918. News of the surrender found General Leto Vorbeck in Rhodesia, with newly captured supplies and in better shape than he had been in months. Eventually forced to accept the ill news, Leto Vorbeck surrendered at Abercorn, Rhodesia, on the 25th of November, 1918. This ended the prolonged stalemate between the German and British forces in Africa. While proportionally, the loss of life was small compared to the cataclysmic carnage in Europe, the human toll was no less substantial. Outside of the military casualties, which numbered over 10,000, the loss from tropical disease and hunger pushed the number well over 100,000 in the British forces alone. Beyond casualties, the war introduced some serious questions about race, colonialism, and the modernization of Africa that would linger on in the decades to come. Most prominent was the question of African loyalty to their colonial masters. In Vorbeck's surrendering forces of the 14,000 Iskari recruited for the Schutz troop in German East Africa, there were nearly 1,200 to witness the capitulation. Nearly 3,000 had been reported as deserters, 4,500 missing, and 4,200 captured. Iskari loyalty was a complex matter when it came to war with the Allies. Loyalty to the German Empire was second to their loyalty to their direct commanders and their ability to navigate the war in Africa while maintaining their status in post-war Africa. As the war had progressed out of German East Africa in 1916, the loyalty of the Ascari became strained. Apart from having to fight outside German East Africa, problems with insufficient food, equipment, and pay began to sap their willingness to fight in the closing years of the war. Leto Vorbeck, however, remained a dedicated supporter of the Ascari. When asked about his actions in East Africa before his death in 1964, Leto Vorbeck stated that his forces were ill-supplied from Germany, but were loyal to the cause. Upon his return to Germany, Leto Vorbeck secured back pay for the Escari in 1927. In the post-colonial world, it is odd to consider colonized peoples fighting to the death in the name of their European colonizers. As in Europe, the African experience of World War I went beyond the immediate combat casualties. The mobilization of tens of thousands of Africans for the colonial units had a lasting effect on the future politics of nationalism in Africa. This was influenced by the introduction of European languages, a money-based economy created by their pay, and the introduction to industrial technologies such as the mechanics of a modern port and railway system. The Africans had also proved to be capable fighting men who had supported the colonial cause and now demanded rights or independence. Another domino had fallen in the great dismantling of the European and African colonies. Leto Vorbeck's Little War proved a valuable military lesson as well, a lesson that would be learned time and time again, that a small but highly motivated guerrilla force 
could hold a modern army hostage even in an age of advancing military technology. By removing the need to hold territory, Leto Vorbeck exploited the weakness of manpower, communication, technology, and transportation needed by a modern army moving in the field. Long before the guerrilla campaigns in the Philippines in World War II, or the campaigns of revolutionaries in South America and Africa during the mid-20th century, Leto Vorbeck mastered guerrilla warfare and provided a number of case studies of some of its most potent attributes. In many ways, German East Africa during World War I was a preview of future conflicts to come in Africa and around the globe. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.